Today's video is a pretty difficult one, because as you may notice from this map, there is no unified Italian state to discover America and project power there. So, while I will still try to keep realism alive as much as possible, it may have to bend a lot to prevent the wannabe colonialists from getting carved up by their more powerful neighbors. This video topic was suggested by Paladin, who donated over $100 to our charity stream last year, so thank you. The start of our scenario revolves around Columbus. While laymen might know him as the Spanish explorer who discovered the Americas, many of you will know that he wasn't actually Spanish. He was in fact Italian, specifically from the Trading Republic of Genoa, soon pestering all sorts of Western European courts, asking them for support so he could go travel to the edge of the world. But, as you'll know, he didn't fall off the edge of the world. Instead he reached what was, from Europe's perspective, a whole new world. News of this quickly reached Spain, and from there spread fast to the other regions of Europe. The cat was now out of the bag, and America was open for business. But maybe Spain could have kept their American secret for longer had they used private internet access, today's sponsor. With today's internet, using a VPN is practically necessary for basic security, as it helps hide your internet activity from the eyes of corporations and other snoopers. For just $2 a month, you can protect your online activity. But even if that is not something you care about, it is also very useful for things like watching Netflix. I love to watch my favorite series, House MD, yet in America, it is completely unavailable. Watch me swiftly change my server to somewhere else, and now I can watch the series without any issue. You don't need to worry about protecting your laptop, phone, or any other device separately, as a single PIA account is enough to protect an unlimited amount of devices. So what are you waiting for? Go click the link in the description to gain a special discount and keep yourself safe online for only $2 a month. A big thanks to PIA VPN for sponsoring this video and let's get back to the scenario. Now the change in this alternate history suggests that Columbus seeks a sponsor closer to home. Rather than the Spanish kings, Italian rulers would sponsor the expedition. Here the question quickly becomes, who in Italy would sponsor them? Italians already dominated the trading routes of the Mediterranean, having a near monopoly on spreading eastern goods into the rest of Europe. Why waste money and time on exploring new trading routes which Italy would struggle to dominate? In terms of potential candidates though, the most obvious ones are Genoa and Venice. Both are already well-established trading empires, which ironically takes them out of the running, as they stand to lose most from such an expedition. The smaller states wouldn't have the means, Milan is landlocked, and the Pope wouldn't care. Out of the remaining options, Savoy, Florence, and Naples, I consider Florence the most likely option. The other two are monarchies, while Florence is a republic at the time and more likely to be interested in such a mercantile gamble. Around this time, the Medici dynasty was in power in Florence, an extremely rich banking family. Yet also around this time, the French were attempting to conquer Naples, and in order to get there, their army had to pass through Florence. Piero de Medici attempted to remain neutral, but that wouldn't stop the French, who attacked Florentine fortresses, and as a result, Piero de' Medici was ousted from power and exiled. It is during this exile that I suggest that the Medici, in a desperate attempt to remain relevant, give Columbus the funds he requires for an expedition to the West. For the Medici, it was either get rich by finding Asia or fade into irrelevancy in exile. Now here again, we reach a major issue. Italian-sponsored Columbus reaches the Caribbean take some stuff and comes back to his sponsors. They gain some money from the curiosity and send out further expeditions. But, much like in our timeline, knowledge of such an exploration spreads very quickly, especially to Spain and Portugal, who are still by far the best situated to take advantage of the discovery. If we're being fully realistic, the Medici gain some nice prestige and wealth from some early voyages but Spain and Portugal take the early initiative anyways. And even once the Medici manage to reclaim power in Florence, what is tiny Florence realistically going to do 
if Spain starts messing with their boats. Even if Spain doesn't straight up invade and destroy Florence, simply blockading the Strait of Gibraltar ruins any Italian hope for supplying colonial or trading ventures. These considerations are a big factor into why Italy didn't invest into America during our own timeline. And realistically speaking, even being the first to discover America doesn't help them overcome these issues. But that's boring, and most importantly, not in the spirit of what the requester wanted with the scenario. So instead, I propose a rather unrealistic solution to this problem. Piero de Medici, the exiled lord, let's make him a diplomatic genius. From his exile, he constructs a trading network across Italy, founding the Italian West Indies Company upon his discoveries. I envisage this company as something like a mix between the Hansa League and the Dutch East India Company. Smaller and landlocked Italian nations would be major investors, as well as your average Italian merchant being able to pour money in it. As the company grows, further investments would come in from France, Germany and even Iberia. This way, the unified power of Italy and its merchants might just have a chance to become a player in the coming race for the Americas. Yet of course, this Italian league still faces the same issue that Spain, France or Austria always has an easy threat to militarily subdue the new league, and achieving naval supremacy against Spain is a pipe dream in the short term. The league needs a great power backer, and I believe we can find that in France. France had attempted, and failed, to conquer Naples and Milan, and was very interested in influence in Italy. This Italian league could become a great ally for France, as French government and private money starts flooding into the company as well. Now while this is, in the short term, a decent bet for the Italian league to make, this dependence on France can very soon become a major issue, should things go wrong. But come on, I'm sure they won't, right? Anyways, it has been over 6 minutes by now, it's probably time to start talking about the Americas themselves, huh? I'm sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. To keep up to date with all the latest releases, consider doing so. Thank you. Alright, so, at the time of the European arrival, the Americas had two major empires. In Mexico, the Aztecs had begun their rise to hegemony shortly before the Europeans arrived. And coincidentally, on the other side of the continent, the Inca had recently formed as well. Would the newly formed Italian company pull a Spain and swiftly conquer these empires? I think that's unlikely. The first few expeditions would focus on the Caribbean, where minor ports like Nuevo Florence and Porto de Medici would be established. The island we know as Hispaniola may very well be known as Italiana instead. From here though, the Italian states don't have the same conquistador types as Spain did, nor did they have the same ideological fervor for expansion like the Spanish had, who had just recently completed the Reconquista and were now seeking new regions to conquer for their faith. Rather than conquests, the Italians probably follow their Mediterranean strategy. They can control over key islands and ports to dominate the trade in the region. Their attitudes towards the Mexican states and then the Inca is far more based on good relations and trade rather than attempted domination. From here though, the scenario mostly hinges on what Spain does. Should news of the discovery spread fast and Spain decides to get interested and starts their own expeditions, they are still in the best position for a sudden conquest of Mexico and Peru. Once Spain reaches such a hegemonic position, Italy's early colonization attempts become laughable, and before long, the Italian company goes bankrupt and becomes little more than an interesting tidbit in history. Remember, Cortes historically conquered Mexico with 400 Spanish soldiers, and Pizarro conquered the Inca with only 180 men. Spain doesn't need to invest much to make this a reality. Still, it's a far more interesting scenario if we keep the Spanish at bay, else we'd quickly return to something close to our timeline. Still, remember that this is still a very serious possibility despite the changes we've made. Let's instead assume that the discovery of the new world, while raising some eyebrows, doesn't cause Spain to become immediately interested. 
Much like how England and France weren't immediately interested in our timeline. It is the Italians who dominate the early race for Central America, while Portugal mostly gets involved in Brazil, as they see it as a nice base for expeditions to Africa and Asia, where their main focus remains for now, leaving Italy with a big head start. Importantly, the Treaty of Tordesillas, where America was divided between the Spanish and the Portuguese, never takes place. While this treaty would eventually lose relevance anyways, the complete lack of it now, as well as the lack of a hegemonic level of Spanish control, may very well incentivize a far earlier arrival of England and France into the colonial game. But the biggest consequence of this lack of Spain, and generally slower initial European action, is that Spain conquered the native empires while they were suffering greatly from newly introduced European diseases. Due to the new trading relations, the natives would still suffer greatly, yet now they might have the time to recover, while trading with the Italians slowly introduces gunpowder technology to the region. We know from our own timeline that the tribes of North America, who had managed to recover from diseases before the Europeans arrived, remained a major threat to them, and their alliances were crucial for the Franco-British rivalry in the region. Even the pre-industrial might of America with technological and population overmight on the continent, struggled with fully conquering the natives until the mid-1800s. Should, after the first 50 years or so, the natives not have gotten conquered yet, an easy conquest of entire empires by a group of 200 Europeans becomes impossible. While these regions would not have it easy, as they still face around 150 years of disease fueled population collapse, at least, they have remained independent. Over the coming centuries then, Spain and the Italians begin an intense struggle for control over the Caribbean region, which would also soon spread to Mexico, as the two rivals start to conquer and influence the various states of the region. The Aztecs very much wouldn't survive this competition, and their successor states become pawns in the larger Italo-Spanish power struggle. The Inca though, I have far more faith in. They are like the China of the Americas, and extremely rich in silver. Their strong central government could easily get a monopoly on European guns and protect, if not eventually expand, their empire. Out of all the American states and tribes, the Inca I have the most faith in to survive and compete with the Europeans. Yet the basic fact still remains that Spain is by far the more powerful power in this rivalry. They have an entire kingdom backing them, multiple actually, and the constant fear remains that a simple Spanish invasion wipes out the Italian company. To prevent this, while the Italian company would thrive from their American empire, it finds itself more and more indebted and subjected to the French, the only power willing and able to seriously contest Habsburg power. Still, the balance of power here isn't as it was in our timeline. The biggest change of this timeline has yet to be explored and it is the lack of American gold for the Spanish. The gold and silver from America turned Spain from a middling power to the hegemonic great power in Europe, while the empire of Charles V would still form and would still be very powerful, it is nothing compared to what it was in our timeline. By 1500, France had around 15 million people, Spain 6.5, and, and their direct holdings in Germany and the Low Countries around 6. Combining it all, as well as some Italian territories, France still had a larger population than the entire Habsburg realm put together. Of course, population isn't everything, but even in those other things, France had the edge. The Habsburg had to worry about the Ottomans in Austria and in the Mediterranean, where France can spend most of its energy on concentrated fights against the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs are spread thin across Europe fighting against multiple great powers at the same time. Even internally, Spain is a collection of dozens of kingdoms and realms merely united in a personal union, but each with a different level of taxation and authority for the king, while France is far more unified. Finally, Spanish rule at the time was pretty incompetent, investing the wealth they did get in terrible ways and forcing many competent and wealthy people away from their nation due to religious reasons. I am saying all of this for the very simple conclusion 
that without the insane amount of gold that Spain got from the Americas, they would start to struggle against the rising French way, way earlier. Now this is pretty difficult to map out, and especially during the reign of Charles V, in alliance with the English, the French would still be mostly boxed in, but once the Habsburg Empire splits in two, the Reformation takes place, weakening their state, I have little doubt that a century earlier than in our timeline, France will start beating the Habsburgs as their disconnected holdings are being squeezed. Italy becomes a major player in this rivalry, and with it, still a major target for Habsburg hopes to regain the upper hand over France. Here, I will split the timeline in two. One where things go well for the Italian company in these difficult times, and one where they very much don't. The first, and in my mind, the more likely option, is that the Italian company slowly declines after a century of prospering. Their route to the Americas is just so much longer, so easy for Spain to disrupt, and even with French backing, a random Habsburg army sacking much of Italy during a war with France is not crazy to imagine. Even if France later manages to liberate them again, these raids would hurt the Italians a lot. And, as always, it would put the Italians further and further under French control. Internal division over whether to support France, remain neutral, or go to the Habsburg side tears the league apart internally, while ever-increasing competition with Spain is slowly weakening the Italian position in America, especially when the British also began to harass and seize Italian holdings in the region. The Italian West Indies Company remains an interesting tidbit in history, sure to inspire future ventures, but it's now over. During its collapse, its holdings would be nationalized, but interestingly, not by Italian states, or at least, I highly doubt that Florence would be able to project much power on their own if they tried. More likely, France does something like buying off all investors at a greatly reduced rate, and most of the Italian holdings, not already seized by enemies, become directly held by the French crown. This timeline mostly favors France, who are now by far the strongest European power, and depending on how badly the Spanish beat the Italians, also control one of the largest colonial empires. We have now gone too deep into this alternate timeline to say anything for certain, but a far greater rise of France is very likely, as even more of the 16th and especially 17th century is spent by the other European powers trying to contain France. The most terrifying thing for this alternate Europe though is that this France, as an earlier maritime power, might just have the naval power to do something like invade Britain, or at least intervene during a civil war to keep a Catholic monarch on the throne. Should this be the case, French hegemony over Europe is nearly secure, and that is a truly terrifying prospect. The second major timeline is far more unlikely and assumes the long-term success of the Italian company. This would again, to a large degree, depend on France successfully preventing Spain or Austria from rampaging across Italy. This is not totally unthinkable, but it would probably require a successful French conquest of at least Milan and possibly also Naples. You might already start to see the major issue with this, as another behemoth France is now in the works. Adding to this, Spanish supply routes to the lowlands are very much dependent on a route from Italy through the Holy Roman Empire. If this supply is disrupted, and Spain is far more focused on the Mediterranean, the lowlands become near unholdable for the Spanish. But even for our Italian league, this development can quickly turn bad. While France is established in Italy like this, Italy as a whole basically becomes a French puppet automatically. While the Italian company initially continues to operate independently, French golden influence continues to seep into the company's leadership and organization. Eventually, French shareholders and officials reach a tipping point, where the name Italian West Indies Company becomes a flat-out lie. Once again, this timeline is quickly headed towards a massive French empire in both Europe and the Americas. It's crazy how that keeps happening when we remove their main rival. The most interesting option though, despite being even more unlikely, sees the Italian company prosper in the Americas 
while not directly picking a side in the Habsburg-French wars, allowing the two great powers to weaken each other without Italy hurting themselves. The reason why I think this is so unlikely is because it basically requires Spain to just not care about colonizing, Spain and Italy reaching a deal to coexist in America, or for the Italian company to side with the Habsburgs against France instead. This third option is the most likely, but still, I doubt this cooperation would last for long. Anyways, if this is the case, in the long term, and I'm talking centuries here, the Italian company might inspire an early form of nationalism, as central Italy starts to unify top-down in a federal model. I could see a declining Genoa join eventually as well, though other states, like the Papal States, Naples and Savoy, are unlikely to participate. Still, should this Italian federation play their cards right, they might be the perfect middlemen in European wars. They can control over Milanese territories to prevent Habsburg-French wars over them, for example. With such a more unified and peaceful Italy, far more ambitious colonial ventures might become a possibility. Again though, way too much in Europe has changed for me to say anything specific about the balance of power in such a world. In all of these timelines, but especially the ones where the Italians create a major and long-lasting colonial empire, there is a great chance that in whatever eventual post-colonial world, we have some Italian majority nations, probably mostly centered around the Caribbean. In timelines where the Italian company gets destroyed in the 1600s though, even their largest settler colonies will probably get overrun by their new overlords, and the existence of a once great Italian colonial empire goes down in history in the same manner as the Dutch or Swedish colonies in our timeline. For now though, this is the end of the video. Thank you all for watching, and consider leaving a like and a comment, as well as subscribing. If you've enjoyed this video, click the video on top to watch another in this series. If you've already seen it, then I'm sure that the bottom video is great too. Once again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.